Bibles tonight, if you would, to the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew chapter 6 tonight, and we want to start reading at verse 5, follow with me, Matthew chapter 6, beginning our reading at verse 5. Jesus is speaking, and he says, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. They love to pray, standing in the synagogues and in the corner of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret. And thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. And let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the testimony of the Lord Jesus. And we thank you that we can gather together tonight and sing praises to you and offer our gifts to you and serve you and worship you and hear from you, be challenged and changed by the preaching of your word and the receiving of it. And I just pray, my Father, that you might go out and open the lips of your servant to speak in the heart of every person, that you might do your work, accomplish your will, and make us all that you desire us to be. We put ourselves before you now voluntarily and ask that you might speak to our hearts and change our lives. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord Jesus is addressing the subject of giving in verses 1 through 4 and the subject of prayer in verses 4 through 15. He is about to teach the disciples how to pray with the model prayer which has been, has been come to be known as the Lord's Prayer. Now one thing I want you to notice is from verse 7 is that the Lord taught His disciples not to use vain repetitions like the heathen do and expect God to accept that as prayer. In other words, there are those who pray the same prayer over and over and over and over out of rote. I would also liken that to people who read printed prayers. That kind of bugs me. I've been at ceremonies, I've been at weddings, I've been here and there, and I've seen preachers get up and they'll say, let us pray, and everybody will bow their head, and then they'll read their prayer off of a piece of paper. That is a pet peeve of mine, I guess, because to me that's not prayer, that's recitation, that's reading. Um... Prayers talking to God. I don't talk to you. I don't come up to you with a pre-written piece of paper, and that's not how I communicate with you. I talk to you face to face, my heart to your heart, my mind to your mind, and that's what God wants us to do. And so from this we know that the Lord is not giving the Lord's Prayer as something to memorize and repeat over and over again. Once a prayer becomes memorized and repeated, it becomes vain and repetitious. Jesus has given the Lord's Prayer as an example of how Christians are to pray. He's helping us understand the components of prayer and the content of prayer. We also see in verse 9 that the Lord says, After this manner therefore pray ye. He didn't say, not with these exact words. He didn't say, repeat after me. He said, after this manner. In other words, he's saying, when you pray, pray something like this. You see. And according to verse 8, God is not impressed with much speaking or long-winded prayers just for long-windedness sake or prayers that impress men. And so we must be careful that our prayers are not for men's ears, but for God. I'm afraid that some of our prayers are designed to impress men rather than to please God. Now right in the middle of all this, the Lord has verse 8. He says, Be not ye therefore like unto them. For your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. 
He's telling us that we're not informing God of anything when we pray. We don't have to arrest God's attention or fill Him in on anything that we might have need of. He already knows. He's always known. Because one of His attributes is omniscience. That is, He's all-knowing and has been from eternity past. Don't try to wrap your minuscule brain around such boundless truth. Just believe it. Further, I want you to notice that the Lord's Prayer, we don't find one specific request. Did you ever notice that? Have you ever looked at the Lord's Prayer and realized there's nothing specific there? The Lord's Prayer is really given in generality. Why? Because Jesus is not saying, I want you to pray this prayer, these words, every time you talk to God. He's saying, no, this is the kind of prayer. So there's no specific thing mentioned in there. He says, thy will be done. Whatever it is, and we don't even know what it is. But we're supposed to be submitted to the Lord. It says, give us this day our what? Daily bread. In other words, supply all our needs, even the ones we don't know about. And then he says, forgive us our debts. Even the debts that we do not recognize, that we have incurred. And the word debt here refers to our sins. Our sins of commission and our sins of omission. And so really, this is a prayer of faith, isn't it? Leaving it up to God because He knows all and He knows best. So sometimes we don't even know what to pray. He knows. When you don't know what to ask for, He knows. When you can't think of any debts, there are some, and He knows. You know, this is a testament to the greatness of God, isn't it? But the verse that speaks to my heart tonight is verse 8. And verse 8 tells us, He knows. Look at it again. Be not ye therefore like unto them. For your Father knoweth what things ye have need of, when? Before ye ask Him. He knows before I know. He knows before the thing becomes a need. He knows before the thing that is a need even became a thing. He knows. God's awesome. And He knows. But sometimes we treat, like, we treat God like He doesn't know. Sometimes we treat like God like He's startled, as we are. Or maybe He's flummoxed, as we are. Or that He, he needs to be informed, like we do. He's not. He knows. But when we're being like that, treating God as if He is as worried about things as we are, or treating God as if He's in need like we are, or that He, he needs to be comforted, no, we're supposed to be comforted in the fact that, you know what, His disciples were the same way. His disciples were the same way, and He was right there with them. Now let me show you a few instances in the New Testament where the Lord's disciples basically had the attitude of this. Lord, what are we going to do now? Do you ever feel like that? Do you ever feel like, Lord, what are we going to do now? Let me show you a couple instances. First one we have is in John chapter 2. Let's go there. John chapter 2. And the first point is this. We have no wine. We have no wine. John chapter 2, verse 1. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. All right, so here's the picture. Jesus and his disciples are invited to this wedding. And so they show up at the wedding. And Jesus and his disciples would like some wine. And so they say to Mary, the mother of Jesus, would like some wine. She says, well, they have no wine. They don't have any wine. It goes on to say this. Jesus saith unto her, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. Now, this is nothing disrespectful. This was a very common, respectful response in that time period. What he's saying is to her is, well, you know, she said they have no wine. 
and he got the message. And he's saying to her, woman, that's, that's not my affair. The, my time has not yet come. In other words, I, I'm not, the time for me to reveal myself through miracles hasn't come yet. So don't, what are you, what are you, what are you saying? See? And his mother saith unto the servants, she's awesome, this Mary, she's pretty cool. And his mother saith to the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Isn't that awesome? Here's this mother asking her son, they don't have any wine, and in that, in that statement, they don't have any wine, she's saying, we don't have any, so would you do something about it? And he says, well, I'm not, I'm not really supposed to be doing that yet. And she goes, whatever he tells you to do, do it. In other words, he'll do it. That's, that's great faith, isn't it? So the Lord's mother tells the servants to do whatever Jesus requires. Mary knew who Jesus was. And she knew what Jesus could do. And everyone else thought that they were in an embarrassing situation, but Mary knew better because Jesus was here. Without Jesus, they had no wine. Without Jesus, it was an embarrassing situation. Without Jesus, the party's over, so to speak. Now, I don't think she knew exactly what Jesus was going to do, but she knew he would do something. Why? Because she asked him. That's why. Sometimes Jesus, sometimes we don't have no wine. You know why? We've run out and we haven't asked Jesus. Well, why won't God do that? Have you asked him? Now, here's a miracle. Jesus told them to fill the water pots with what? Water, because they didn't have any wine. All they had was water. And then Jesus said, I want you to fill the water pots, and then I want you to deliver them to the steward of the feast. And so, here are these servants... And they're just doing what Jesus told them to do, right? So they go over and they get these water pots and they take them over and they fill them up with water. And now they've got to take them over to the governor of the feast. And they're probably wondering, what's going on here? So they pick up these pots full of water and by the time they get over to the steward of the feast, it's wine. A miracle takes place. And that little short period of time, that little short distance, Jesus can do a miracle in a split second. And when the governor of the feast tasted the wine, and here's the thing, he knew they were out of wine. Mary knew they were out of wine. The governor of the feast, he's the guy running the whole show. He knows they're out of wine. And all of a sudden, three water pots show up with wine, and he's probably saying, where did this come from? And he goes to taste it to make sure that it's wine to give to his guests. And he's amazed because this wine was perfect. Of course it was perfect. Jesus made it. Now he said, this is good wine. He said, usually, we, you know, we start and, uh, but we don't save the good wine till the last. Now this, this phrase, good wine, is talking about new wine. It's talking about unfermented wine. Amen. Fermented wine is older wine that has become degraded and has become alcoholic. Now, from what I understand, the ancients took great care to keep their wine from fermenting because they preferred it for its sweetness and its taste being unfermented. Now, let me just give you an illustration. Now, You've, most of you have had grape juice, right? And I would say that a lot of you in here have had wine. Now, when you, when you take a glass of grape juice, you drink it, and it's like, oh, that's good. Mm, mm, mm. But the first time you drink a glass of wine, it's like, uh, uh, your body says, what is this? We don't want this. Why? Because this is degraded. It's alcoholic. Your body reacts, and if, your initial reaction to alcohol was negative. And you had to force yourself 
to drink it and force yourself to like it and until your body says, oh, this is what we're supposed to like? Okay, we're liking it and we're wanting it. But your body originally, same thing when you smoke. Nobody takes their first puff and goes, ah, oh, that's so refreshing. <laughs> now, I remember my first smoke. About killed me. But I wanted to be cool, see? So I made my body get used to it. I remember my first drink as a, as a young person. And I wanted to be cool. And I wanted to be tough. And I wanted to be a man. And I, and I drank it and it just about made me throw up. But I kept it in and I kept it down. And I made my body take it. New wine doesn't do that. New wine is sweet. Grape juice is good stuff. It's good wine. Alcoholic wine's bad wine. So kids, grape juice, good wine, good wine. Wine, bad wine, bad wine. You hear me? Alcoholic wine, bad wine. Remember that, bad wine. Okay. Now, new wine or unfermented wine was often used in place of water in the households of the ancients. And so you wouldn't be serving alcoholic wine all the time to your kids and drinking it all day long. Now, the ruler of the feast had no idea where this delicious and refreshing wine came from, but the servants did, and Mary did, and of course Jesus did. To the servants and the governor and the disciples, it was like this, Lord, what are we going to do? We have no wine. See the panic? Maybe you don't have no wine, but you have Jesus. And Jesus can make water into wine Amen. if he has to, if he wants to. And so they had no wine. Number two, go with me to Matthew chapter 16. Matthew number 16, point number two is this, we have no bread. Matthew chapter 16, verse 7. Speaking of the disciples, it says, And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Which when Jesus perceived, he saith unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves because ye have brought no bread? Now, Jesus has mentioned leaven. And in verse 7, right away the disciples start reasoning among themselves that they have no bread. Just at the mention of leaven, they said, Oh no! What are we going to do? We don't have no bread. We, we've, we don't have bread. The word reasoned here is the word diogid somahi. It means to deliberate, to discuss, to argue. And so they're arguing with each other. They're saying, what are we going to do now? We have no bread. We've got to bring bread. Whose job was it to bring bread anyway? It wasn't my job to bring bread. Nobody told me to bring bread. When did I become responsible for the bread? Well, what are we going to do now? What are we going to tell Jesus? We don't have no bread. See it? They're all, they're all fussed up about it, aren't they? Doesn't that sound like us? Jesus wasn't even talking about bread. He was speaking of the spiritual, and all they could think about was the physical. Look at verse 9. Jesus said to them after this, Do you not understand, neither remember the five loaves among the five thousand and how many baskets you took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand and how many baskets you took up? How is it that you do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread, that ye should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then understood they how he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. So Jesus is asking his disciples how they could even worry about bread. <laughs> when they saw him feed 5,000 people with only five loaves of bread, and they saw him feed 4,000 people with only seven loaves of bread, and then they had leftovers to boot. Here they are. We don't have no bread. We don't have no bread. What are we going to do? We don't have no bread. And Jesus is saying, what are you so worried about? Didn't you see what we did, I did over there? Did we have bread then? 
Did we have enough bread for 5,000? No. Did they all get fed? Yes. Was there leftover? Did we have enough bread for 4,000? No. Did, did we have bread enough for 4,000? Was there leftover? Yes. Then when are you worrying about bread for this little crew? If I can feed 5,000, I can feed us. If I can feed 4,000, I can feed us. Right? It doesn't matter how many loaves of bread or how many people. Because Jesus is able. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. There could have been 50,000 people and one loaf of bread, and Jesus could have fed them all. We are of little faith when we sell Jesus short. When we think that some situation is too big for him to handle. Actually, if we read Mark chapter 8 and verse 14, we find that they did have one loaf. And so here, look, here's, here are the disciples. They got one loaf. And they're, they're saying, well, we only got one loaf. What are we going to do? We don't have enough bread. We have no bread for this crowd, for this crew. How will we? They had a loaf. And that's why Jesus said, wait a minute. You remember what I did with five loaves? You remember what I did with seven loaves? One loaf is plenty. When you have Jesus. They were saying, we don't have enough. Jesus said, you got plenty, you got me. You see, with Jesus, one loaf is enough. That's what he wants us to learn. He knows when we need bread. And he knows how much bread we need. And Jesus can feed you. Jesus can take care of you. You see, they were all worried because we have no wine. But Jesus was there and took care of it. They're all worried. We have no bread. But Jesus is there. He can take care of it. Let's look at number three. Go to Matthew chapter 17. And we find out we have no money. See, we have no wine. We have no bread. Now here's the third one. We have no money. Matthew chapter 17, verse 24. And when they were come to Capernaum, they that received tribute money came to Peter and said, Doth your master pay tribute? He saith, Yes. He didn't even ask Jesus. He just said yes. And when he was coming to the house, Jesus prevented him. In other words, Peter's coming in to say, Lord, I just promised them we're going to pay taxes. We don't have got no money. What are we going to do? But before he could say that, Jesus said, What thinkest thou, Simon? Of whom do the kings of the earth take custom or tribute? Of their own children or of strangers? Peter saith unto him, Of strangers. Jesus saith unto him, Then are the children free? Notwithstanding, lest we should offend them, go thou to the sea, and cast a hook, and take up the fish that first cometh up. And when thou hast opened his mouth, thou shalt find a piece of money, that take and give unto them for me and thee. Is Jesus awesome or what? Here we have the disciples, they're all consternated because they don't have any money with which to pay their taxes. And so here they are, what are we going to do now? Are we...